can try and bridge these positions, charting a path to ensuring at least some space for dialogue and cooperation with China, even as the West confronts and competes where necessary. Fourth, we have a strong foreign office, now with the old Department of Development within it. I was not in agreement with the merger. I'm opposed to the cut in aid because I think it will weaken our global claims. But we still have a big budget. The merger, if properly used, could make more coherent our foreign policy offer and make it weightier. Fifth, of course, our armed forces are globally admired. We should invest in them and make them at the cutting edge of military innovation in personnel, assets, and deployment. We should aspire also to be thought leaders. We can't alter our size, but countries do in the old cliche punch above their weight, and that should be our, amb our ambition. When I look at some of the countries my institute works with, they may be small population countries, but their reach is disproportionate to their size. The UK is a larger country, but the principle is the same. They have, however, all of these countries that punch above their weight. They got one thing in common, and that is political leadership prepared to take tough, courageous, bold decisions. And here is where the state of British politics makes me queasy. Both main political parties have contradictions to resolve. The Brexit coalition, which brought the Conservative Party its election victory, consists of some who see Brexit as the facilitator of a new reforming global Britain. And others, notably in the old Labour seats of the North, who see Brexit as allowing us to return to the nation we once were. One is small r radical, the other small c conservative. The Labour Party also has a tension between its modernizing wing, which sees radical change as coming from new forms of economic and social capital, and then its old small c conservative left, which believes that the solutions lie in the return to traditional institutions of collective and state power. Therefore, the colossal downside risk for Britain is that the political debate continues in conventional directions. Who spends or taxes more? Who supports most the NHS? Who's most generous with welfare? Umpteen versions of who preserves the status quo best when it's only by rigorous analysis of the way the world is changing that we have any actual prospect of securing the future. Now, these contradictions can be resolved and a strong, successful, outward-looking Britain can arise post-Brexit. But only if we accept Brexit of itself doesn't make it so, and without action and leadership, Brexit will only exacerbate the challenge the forces of change at work in the world present us unless we make a supreme effort to understand these forces, harness them, and make them our servant. So this is the moment of truth for the pro-Brexit and anti-Brexit camps alike. The answers aren't going to be found in outdated ideology, but in unifying values, clarity of thinking, competence, and delivery. And this is the political space, therefore, post-Brexit, that we have to inhabit. The alternative is inexorable decline. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for those thoughts, as ever challenging to both sides of the political spectrum. And thank you also for clarifying that that mural is not a throwback to cool Britannia, but it's actually about something much more substantive and serious. Um, in the speech, you talk about the need for rigorous analysis of the way the world is changing. And the Center for Economics and Business Research said recently that because of the pandemic, China will now overtake the US as the world's largest economy in 2028. Now, Elon Musk, who has just become the world's richest man, once said, the foundation of war is economics. So should those of us who believe in democratic values, open societies, liberal democracies, should we be worried? Uh, yes, we should be worried, um, because the central challenge of, of, of liberal democracy, in my view, is not the one that we often think it is. We tend, 
both politicians and media tend to think of the challenges to do with transparency or accountability. It's actually not, it's to do with efficacy. The challenge of democracy is can you get stuff done? In, in, in a world of change, you've got to change. So if you take, for example, the healthcare debate in, in the UK, I mean, at the last election, you could have had the same debate on healthcare in the 1980s. I mean, you're probably too young to remember, but those are the debates back then, right? You know, Labour would say, well, the Tories would say, we're gonna, we love the health service, we're going to spend more. And Labour would say, well, you don't really love it, and we're going to spend even more. So the question for healthcare today in, in the 21st century is how do you utilise technology, develop innovative treatment? How do you pay attention to public health and prevention and not just cure? How do you make sure you get the right intersection between social care and um, the rest of your healthcare system. Questions that require you to change systemically the way that you work. And the problem for democracy is that it's finding reform and change very difficult. And that's why it's, it's lurched into populism because the populist comes along and says, look, it's an easy solution, right? You build the wall or you do the Brexit or whatever. And of course, the solutions aren't easy. They're really difficult and require deep systemic change. So that is the challenge of liberal democracy today. Um, and it's, it's a challenge because for the first time in the world where I notice I'm going to countries, for the first time in my political lifetime, I'm going to countries. And where is the conversation I would have had with them 20 years ago? If they weren't a democracy, they'd say that's our ambition though. It's just we can't get there at the moment, or it's going to take us time, or we're on a steady progress towards it. And now the conversation is different, frankly. The conversation's often, yeah, but you guys just don't seem to be working very well. So that's what I think. Yes, I think we, we I, I'm, look, I happen to believe in liberal democracy passionately, and you don't misunderstand me, but our challenge is effectiveness. It's how do we make change for our people in a world that needs change? So let me just unpick some of that. One of the things that people want with an effective government is proper managing of the economy. And indeed, one of the reasons we defeated the Soviet Union was our economic superiority and our superiority, particularly on technology. And you said in your comments just then that you thought Britain needs to be at the forefront of technological innovation. But right now, there's a big debate as to whether China will, in fact, be the one that develops superior technology partly because they have looser rules on privacy, which will give them an advantage with big data and AI. So how important is it, even if China becomes a, a larger economy overall, for the West to stay ahead on tech? And if we want to do that, how should we? It's hugely important. And, and we, we, we can do it by um, keeping our universities really strong and developing because they are the centers of innovation. I mean, you look at the great stuff that's coming out even in the course of the pandemic, most of it starts with universities. Um, you're gonna need a strong environment for enterprise, for people starting businesses. You need to invest heavily in your education system. Um, you need to make sure that your infrastructure is fully up to date. And we have a, an advantage over uh, China, which I think will find it increasingly difficult if the more repressive position of the state starts to give people who want to start businesses and are enterprising and interest in innovation, give them the sense that they can only do that within the confines of the state. But we're also gonna have to change our way of thinking. I mean, it is to my mind, absurd that we don't already have biometric ID, right? If you want to solve a lot of the problems that you've got around welfare fraud, and from welfare fraud through to immigration, you need, you need a, a system of identity. And all these arguments around privacy have been completely overtaken by technology. You know, so what you may remember a few years back when DeepMind was doing that experiment in the London hospitals and the, you know, the clattering they got from it. But in the end, of course, you should be using technology and data. And there are all sorts of ways you can protect privacy, but 
If you're not, we've got a massive opportunity with the National Health Service to be using data in a constructive way and to fuel the next wave of innovation as a result. So it, that's why I mean by saying it requires political leadership that's prepared to analyze the way the world is and take the bold decisions to get there. But some of it, none of it's going to be easy. Around the time that you became Labour leader, uh, a writer from the US called Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History, in which he basically said liberal democracy has won game over. Then you look at what happened on Capitol Hill last week, and also the, the big social divisions we've had in the wake of the financial crisis. Do you think we've just been too complacent about the superiority of Western political systems? Um, I mean, in short, yes. The question is, what have we lost that, that could have circumvented some of these issues? And, and again, I'm just going to be very uh, blunt with you about it, Jeremy. We, we lost a strong radical political centre. That's the place where the best change comes from in the world today. Because the solutions are not really ideological. And the problem for the West is, it got a bad dose of ideology just at the time when the technology revolution was meaning those solutions are completely you know, out of date. Values matter. It's not that, that you know, values and ideals don't matter, but the practical job of making your societies fit for purpose and making sure, for example, that people's wages can carry on rising because you're lifting productivity you know, those, those in the end are resolved, I'm afraid, by people who understand the way the world is and, and acting with the right values and making the right changes. And that's what we've lost. Um, and I, I, I mean, this is just my view. You know, a lot of people disagree with it. But I think the fact that the center then became the place to protect the status quo in an era where people want change, it kind of corroded the center and he went off you know, you can see in our own politics, your party went off after Brexit, my party went off after Jeremy Corbyn, and, you know, hey presto, here we are. But isn't the critique of the, the centre that politicians who espoused centrist policies just made one really huge screw up, which is that they lost touch with a very important chunk of their electorate, whether in Britain, the US or continental Europe, which is essentially those parts of the electorate that don't have university degrees, it's about half of US voters, about two thirds in, in Europe. And if you look at Attlee's cabinet, for example, half of the members of that cabinet had blue collar backgrounds. But by the time you came to power, it was I think just one of your cabinet ministers had a blue collar background. So do we not need to put that right? Yeah, a few, a few more than one, but, but I, don't, I don't really, I think this is a correct analysis actually. First of all, by the way, inevitably, as you know, your Ernie Bevans today would be going to university. I mean, it's just the way it is, right? As, as education improved and more and more people went to university, this was inevitable. And so, you know, people like John Prescott, Alan Milburn were, were very, were, were bound to be exceptional by the time you start to get to that. Um, that period of time. But, but the other thing is that, you see, the center, to hold it, you always had to hold, for example, for the Labour Party, we always had to hold together a coalition of tr very traditional working class, aspirant working class, and the socially liberal. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, what new Labour had, it was those elements together. And, you know, as some, I'm always happy to take responsibility for the things that I actually did in, in government, but we did, we did not ignore that working class element when we were in government, which is why even in 2005, we retained the vast majority of those seats that have now fallen to the Conservatives. No, it was, in fact, the Labour Party moving away from both that aspirant working class and traditional working class and becoming locked into a sort of far left plus socially liberal that lost us a huge chunk of our constituency. So I think it's, and, and you know, in the end, the way that you 
the, the center that, that I'm describing, the way it keeps those people with us is to be carrying on making change. It's only when it becomes the place of the status quo and just says, look, all these people, um, we're reasonable. And all those other guys chasing Donald Trump and Brexit, they're unreasonable. You're never going to win the debate on that basis. You've got to be, you've got to be in touch with those people, but showing how you can improve their lives in a practical way. And that's, I'm afraid, what, what, what we, we lost. And that's why for an issue like immigration, you know, all the time I would always say to people, I'm in favor of immigration to the UK. I think it's done an immense amount for the UK, but you can't treat it as an issue that people don't care about or be indifferent to their anxieties. So I would always say, you've got to have a system with rules, otherwise you'll get one with prejudices. So, you know, th these are the things that keep, keep you together. That's why law and order for me was a labor issue. Because in working class communities, they're the people that suffer from law and order, not the people who can afford to, to live in a nice part of town. Before we move on to the audience, I just want to ask you a couple of things about the international picture, because many people think that the Western Alliance has totally broken down. And you made a fascinating comment about how real alliances are actually forged in adversity. So what needs to happen to put together the group of countries, not all in the West, actually, by any means, but who believe in open societies? Uh, what's Britain's role in making that happen. Robin Niblett of Chat Chatham House argued this week that global Britain is something that needs to be earned and not declared. Do you agree with that? Yeah, 100% agree with that. And I think he put his finger on a very, very important point, I guess in a sense is the point I'm making too. But with the G7, we've got a chance to do something here. I mean, you've got two major issues in which the West should show leadership which is COVID and climate. Those are both issues where Britain as the leader of the G7 can play a real part. I mean, the absence of global cooperation of the pandemic, as, as you, know, you and I have both said, Jeremy, has been shocking. It's been a real abdication of leadership. And what is very clear to me now about the pandemic is that we're, we're just in a new phase of it. So you're going to find in the next year, I think, that we're going to have to be adapting vaccines to new strains of the disease. And the thing that's really changed in my view about the disease in the last few weeks, which is why there's this enormous global pressure to acquire vaccines, is that most policymakers thought you would have three phases to this pandemic. You'd have a starting phase where you lock down. You'd then have a second phase where you had control of the disease, but were living with it for a time. And then you'd have a third phase, reasonably steady, where you rolled out the vaccine. What's happened is that second phase has collapsed. You're now locked down or mass vaccination. And so for Britain, for example, leading the G7 at the moment, it could be mobilizing how we make sure we cure some of the problems that have been exposed in the manufacturing and production, in the research and development, data surveillance. We could be plugging some of those gaps now so that if in the autumn time, we're having to develop new vaccine or in the summer, new vaccines in order to deal with new strains of the disease, we're doing it far faster. And we do it, again, Britain could play a real part in saying, we can't have a situation where the wealthy countries get the vaccines first and the poor countries have got to wait several months later. So no, there's, there's no doubt, but it, the earning point is really important. I mean, the, I can't tell you how often I learned this lesson when I was prime minister. If you don't commit and committing is always painful, you don't get anything back in return. And what often happens with politicians and political leaders is they feel their own politics so keenly, they don't see the other person's politics. And I can just tell you, you forge those relationships and those alliances where you're, the leader you're sitting opposite sees you taking some pain in order to make that alliance work. Then they're with you. 
Thank you. Now, I've just got a couple more questions for you, Tony. And just to tell everyone else, if you want to ask a question to Tony, um, please type it into the uh, chat function and uh, then I will relay those questions to Tony. But you, you did generously say you were happy to talk about your own record. And, um, and I wonder whether I could just um, ask you about a couple of aspects of that which have some salience in modern politics. Um, and, and one of them, you know, you talked about committing and your probably biggest international commitment was to Iraq. And I just wonder whether you think some of the challenges we face in the Western Alliance relate to a loss of moral authority from military endeavors like Iraq, but not just Iraq, Libya could be another one, which haven't turned out as expected. I don't think it's a loss of moral authority, but what people question is whether, because I think most people who are sensible don't question the motives behind it. I think what people question is, did it work out in the way that, that was planned? And the answer to that is no. So the, the, the issue really is what lesson do you learn from that? And I suppose, again, what I would say is you've got to be careful that you don't learn the wrong lesson. You've got to learn the right lessons and not the wrong ones. Um, the right lesson is that when you're, when, and this was the lesson we learned again with the Arab Spring, frankly, is that when you remove the dictatorship, which has been suppressing a whole set of forces within a country for a long period of time, then once you remove that dictatorship, those forces come to the surface and you're in a whole new stage of conflict. But learning the lesson you therefore, which is the lesson a lot of politicians have learned that you therefore stay out of, of all of these situations. Well, you know, that is what means that the future of Syria today is gonna to be determined by Russia and Iran, who have, by the way, committed over 10 years. And Libya probably, I don't know, Turkey, Russia are probably the two main players at the moment there. Um, even though we were instrumental in removing the regime. So I think, no, I think the, the, the important thing is to, is, is yes, of course, to ensure that whatever you're doing is, is done accordance with the right principles and for the right purposes. But I still think the basic point about commitment is clear and, you know, you're not going to be able to determine the future, for example, of what is happening, you, you take what I think is the next big arena, which is the Sahel in the northern part of sub-Saharan Africa, where you could get new waves of extremism and migration. I mean, are the Western nations really committed to trying to help that situation? Much of which, by the way, has come from, from the destabilization in Libya. I'm not sure that we really are, but if we don't, in some years time, will be faced with the consequences of that. Finally, from me, uh, and before we move on to the audience, you talked in your comments about the importance of holding the country together in this post-Brexit period. Um, have things gone according to plan in terms of the devolution settlement that you gave to Scotland? Well, when I was in office, um, I would say that after the initial um, creation of the Scottish Parliament and devolution, it wasn't really a major factor for me as a prime minister. I think what happened subsequent and what has put Scottish independence back centre stage again are two things. First of all, the Labour Party lost its position in Scotland completely, but I think for reasons that were avoidable, um, and really the only effect of opposition that's come to the SNP in the last decade was, was actually when Ruth Davidson was the Conservative Party leader in Scotland. Um, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, and the second thing was Brexit put it back on the agenda again. I mean, I, you know, I'm not just making a sort of crass anti-Brexit point, but I mean, the fact is it's, <clears throat> it's given the nationalists a whole new lease of life because don't forget there was actually a referendum in 2014 and Scotland voted to stay in the UK. Thank you. Well, we've got a lot of questions and um, we've, we've got to finish at two o'clock, but um, I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. And I may group some of them to, to try and make sure that we can get through all of them. 
But, but let me just start with this question from uh, Leslie Birch, who says, it seems to me the US and UK constitutions are out of date and we are no longer representative democracies. Do you agree? And what reforms would you advocate on the constitutional side? Are we not representative democracies? Uh, this is not my question, I have to say, but you know. Uh, I think we are. Constitutional think, reform. But, uh, so, I mean, to be absolutely blunt about it, I was always a skeptic that you could solve a political problem, what is essentially a politics problem with constitutional change, which is not to say I don't, you know, I, I exclude those things. We did a lot of constitu constitutional change to the government, but no, I, I think the basic point is that politics has become deeply polarized. And in the end, democracy is not just about a form, it's about a substance and a spirit. And you can have a form of democracy as people casting their vote, but if one half of the country hates the other half of the country, you're going to find, as the Americans have just found, that legitimacy starts to get challenged, even when it really shouldn't and can't be on any sensible basis. And that's the biggest worry. That's why I say my view is the spirit of a democracy is people being prepared to disagree with each other and still be amicable with each other. And, and when you get, and, this, and social media, of course, itself is a revolutionary phenomenon in the political arena. When you get these violent separations of opinion, that is when democracy can, can be put at risk. And I think that is, I would focus more on that political challenge because I don't think in the end, any amount of constitutional change could solve that. Apart from, by the way, in the American context, ensuring that they stop changing their constituencies so that they're now just red or blue. Uh, that, that is gonna be a huge problem for American years to come. But it, I, I don't, I, I think there's a political challenge here, not a constitutional one, is my honest opinion. Thank you. Now we've got a couple on international uh, relations. Um, Meroin Balatresh from the Kuwait News Agency asks, what's the best way to engage with China? Um, and um, Dominic Karatu, says David Miliband recently talked about the age of impunity, uh, given that we're not likely to confront militarily Russia, China or Iran. Uh, do you support an interventionist foreign policy? Um, so on the first, in my view, what we need with China is what I call a strategic framework for engagement with China and not a series of ad hoc reactions to individual actions of China. So thing to, we have to understand about China is China, China is now a risen power and it's right that it is one of the big powers in the world. It's right by dint of history, civilization, size of population, size of economy, and now technology innovation. The problem is that over the past few years, China has come under a much stricter and stronger control of the Communist Party again. It's reasserted a very iron grip on the country, and that's meant more repression internally and more aggression externally. In my view, the basic principles should be that we need this strategic framework. We should accept we confront China where it's doing things that are unacceptable or contrary to our basic values. We will have to compete with them because competition is going to be natural but we still need to cooperate with, with them in certain key areas. Uh, climate is one, the pandemic is another, um, actually stabilizing the global economy, yet another. So there's no, there's no way out of, in my view, that engagement with China. The question is, what's the best format to do it in? And in my view, there is where America and Europe should try and form a common position, and Britain can play a part in trying to reach that common position. Because the most dangerous thing would be if you have these two rival powers, America and China, and Europe starts to navigate between them. I think that would be a, a, a mistake um, because in the end, the Chinese system will have to evolve. Uh, I don't think you can, you can keep that tight grip on a people that's going to become increasingly prosperous over time. 
Um, so we need to do that very carefully. I am in favor of intervening where it's you know, necessary or sensible and where it can be done you know, to protect our interests. Um, but that doesn't always mean you know, hard military power. Uh, you know, people forget we also, apart from military interventions, we created the Department of International Development, we trebled the aid budget, um, and, you know, our cooperation with the United States on aid brought about the PEPFAR program in the U.S., which is probably the biggest life-saving program the continent of Africa has ever seen. So, you know, there are lots of different ways you can, I, I've always seen this isolationism versus interventionism. It, it, for me, it's never been about, do you put your country's interests first or someone else's interests first? I've always seen it as part of enlightened self-interest to be prepared to intervene in the world. But as I say, that doesn't necessarily mean militarily. Thank you. Now, a question from Federico Bianchi, who's head of press for the EU delegation to the UK. Um, but it's not about Brexit. It's about the role of social media and disinformation and how in a democracy do we balance the need to uphold our values of free speech uh, with avoiding being weakened or threatened in a way that we saw on Capitol Hill last week? Yeah, it's a great question. I honestly wish I knew the answer to it, and I don't. Um, I mean, social media makes political life very, very difficult today. And it can't really be the case that the CEOs of these companies t take the decision as who gets a platform and who doesn't. So I think there's going to be, and it's an area, by the way, there's no reason why the UK and Europe shouldn't work together on this, to look at what is the right regulatory framework um, for social media. And if there's one, you know, I, I spoke a bit about Britain being a thought leader. You know, one of the good things about Britain is, you know, we tend to be you know, most of the time quite reasonable people. And, you know, we share an immense amount in common with European countries, even if we're now out of the EU. And I think getting the right framework for this is going to be important because again, to go back to the point about democracy, if you can't exchange information in a reasonable way with, with some, at least some approximate approximation between facts that are accurate and facts that aren't, it becomes hard to have a democratic political debate. And, and I think this whole, you know, I've been saying for a long time, this, this issue to do with social media technology companies, you've got to take this out of the realm of that, of the corporate, and it's got to become a public interest debate with some public interest regulation around it. Now, quite what that is, is the thing I think it's really difficult, but the present situation can't be, uh, can't be maintained. And I think the public themselves are anxious now about the damage that social media debate does to our political, um, to our political system. Thank you. Now, this is Diego Salama from the United Nations University. And he says, what role should the UK play in the UN? and the multilateral system in general, and how do we justify our, uh, our seat and our permanent veto on the Security Council? Well, you know, it's, um, there's a very strong case for the reform of the UN Security Council, but having tried to initiate a debate about this when I was prime minister and signally failing to get anywhere with it, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure there's a very easy solution because Britain's not going to give up its place on the Security Council. But on the other hand, of course, you look at the world today and say, well, India shouldn't be permanent member of it, Germany, Japan, and then you can start running through a whole series of countries. Um, I think the UN system needs deep reform. I think it would be great if Britain played a part in leading that debate. But, you know, my experience with these things is they only come about when they're forced by necessity. And I want Britain to play a, there's no reason outside of Brexit why Britain shouldn't be a strong multilateral partner, both in the UN and elsewhere. And, you know, we still got, even with the proposed cuts, a very large, significant aid budget, a great footprint on the ground in many parts of the world. So I'm, I'm happy for us to play a part in the UN and other multilateral bodies, but 
I do think our multilateral system needs deep reform, and I, I would include the UN in that. And uh, from Tom Harris, um, you talked about a number of challenges that we've got to face, including China and political relations with other countries. Does having a more liberal US president make that easier? Well, it, American policy is going to be more predictable and it's going to be more multilateral. So in that sense, yes, I think is the answer to that. I think the only thing I think is important is that the new administration, which has got, I mean, I, a lot of very talented people who were part of the Obama administration. But, you know, the world of 2021 is not the same as the world of 2017. And I think it's, yes, it will be easier with this administration, but we need a lot of creativity and new thinking, as well as just being prepared to sit down at the table with all our allies. And, and get along. And you can see this, you know, there will be some very tricky issues between America and Europe, even if there's a great desire all to work together, even this Biden administration is going to be saying, yeah, but come on, on China, what are you guys, are you guys with us or you're not with us? <laughs> you know, and on NATO, they're going to be saying, yes, of course, we're not going to treat you like Donald Trump. But by the way, we agree that you should be increasing your defense spending. So I think, Yes, it will be easier because it, it will be a lot more predictable, but I don't think we shouldn't settle back into our comfort zone. You know, it's, uh, that would be a mistake. Thank you. Now, a couple of questions. Um, Wasik says, uh, what does the centre need to do, as in I think cent centrist thinkers need to do in Britain to evolve against the polarisation of toxic identity politics? Uh, being imported from the US. And Kamina Banga asks, can democracies really bring about systemic change when the parliamentary term is just four to five years? Um, so the way, of, you know, my view, especially for progressive politics, identity politics is a complete dead end. Um, if you end up fighting Fight, fighting on that basis, you, you're just going to end up probably with large periods of conservative government. Um, for me, the, the challenge for progressive politics, to put it in very simple terms, and I think the same is through the challenge to the centre is, focus on what is the big real world change? And the big real world change is technology. So technology is going to change and should change everything. It's going to change the way we work. Well, it already is changing the way we work. Uh, it changes the way we interact with each other. It's going to change every single area of policy you can think of. If you have a discussion today, even with in areas where you don't think of technology being the dominant thing, but you sit down with some people in the defense sector today, 50% of the conversation is about technological change. You know, we're going to have, here and around the world, we're going to have electric vehicles that are driverless. We're going to find, as artificial intelligence progresses, that whole sectors of the economy get changed massively. So my view is, it's, it's rather like the 19th century industrial revolution. If you look back in history, Whigs and Tories carried on arguing about old things years into the industrial revolution. It took politics a long time to catch up with the real world change and the best way to overcome a lot of the divisions is to take this revolution and say, well, look, how do we make it work for people? How do we make sure that we can improve their lives through this? Which of course, by the way, most of this technology is gonna be enormously enabling. And that's the thing. So you rise above the identity politics by having a unifying economic and social message, which is making this revolution work for people. And I, I honestly believe that first group of politicians that understand this technology revolution, master and harness it, will be the ones that, that, that win. Um, and the second question was around the... Uh, four to five, the short parliamentary term. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, well, I, I think it's less to do with the parliamentary term. It's to do with, it's to do really with, with having a clear vision and policy and being prepared to, to drive it through in circumstances where the thing I learned about government is when I was making reforms, the rhythm was almost always like this. You proposed a reform, people told you it was a bad idea. Whilst you were doing the reform, it was hell. And after you'd done the reform, you wish you'd done more of it. And, you know, people forget this now, but if you go back in, in when Margaret Thatcher was making her reforms and leave aside whether you agree or disagree, I mean, there were times when she fell into third place, you know, the, in the politics. And, you know, in the end, the problem today, I think you, you're not going to get out of four or five year terms, but the problem is you've got to be, you've got to articulate a vision and then really get behind it and spend your political capital on trying to push it through. And I learned this too late, in fact, in some ways in my time as prime minister, because in the end, there isn't any change you're ever going to make that isn't painful. And therefore, the risk is, and this is the challenge of democracy in a sense, the risk is you're so busy trying to remain popular that you just sort of keep the status quo and dabble with it here and there. When, as I say, in an era where the world's massively changing, if you're not adapting to that change, you just get left behind. And I think that is the big challenge, but it can only be, it, it's a challenge that's easier to meet if you're, you know, in the end, you've got to trust the people. You've got to have a bold, clear vision and say, okay, it's going to make mean changes. They're going to be difficult. It's going to be very hard going, but we're going to see it through. And my view is that that politics still wins in the end. But the problem is a lot of politicians, particularly with social media battering them today, you know, they, they, they think that's just, that's just a suicidal kamikaze type mission. So we're coming to a close, but I've just got three final questions, if I may. Um, the first is from Julia McFarlane of ABC News, and it relates directly to what you said about getting ahead of the curve on the technology debate. And she's talking about the decision by Twitter to ban Trump. And she asked, should we have specialised ethics committees to decide whether or not governments should have ultimate control or regulate private companies such as Twitter and Facebook? Yeah, so my, my institute put out a paper on this um, a few months back. I mean, I think you've got to treat these companies to a degree as public interest companies. And you know, it can't be right that the CEO of the company decides whether the president of the United States has a platform or not. So you're going to have to find some way of getting a system of regulation that is, is, is not simply driven by the views of the, of the company. Um, so I, I think this will be, this is a big, you know, it's a part of what is a big debate, which is how do you regulate these large technology companies that have an influence politically of an outsized amount. Um, and I don't think you can do that unless you accept to a degree they are public interest companies and not just private corporates. Thank you. Um, and a question from James Strong, uh, who says, there's a lot of negativity in the world at the moment. What are you optimistic about in 2021? You know, what, what I'm optimistic about is that um, at one level, if you see what this pandemic has posed us as a challenge, you know, we the world has carried on functioning. I mean, it's been tough and difficult, but I'm optimistic about the opportunities of technology, technological change. I'm optimistic because even, you know, I spend a lot of time out in the Middle East. I see things happening there that make me optimistic. The Israel uh, United Arab Emirates Accords, for example, which I, I worked on quite a lot. Um, and then I spend a lot of time in Africa, which is the poorest continent in the world. 
this population is set to double. Um, but I feel in the countries we're working in, okay, COVID poses very special problems, but the quality of government's getting better. The life of the people's getting better. Life expectancy is going up. We're actually getting on top of the killer diseases. And even though the challenges are immense, there is real progress. And you take a step back and look at the arc of the last 30, 40 years, you know, the world's lifted more people out of poverty than ever before in human history. So I'm, I'm, I, I remain optimistic. Um, I, I'm just not quite so optimistic as I was about Western democracy right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to exercise chair's privilege, if I may, and give the very final question to my 10 year old son, John. Who, um, who just wants to ask a, a very quick final one. So I'm just going to let John sit in my chair. There we are. Hi, John. How are you? Good, thanks. Nice uh, to see you again. Do you, think, do you think the climate crisis will be over by the time I'm your age? Or do you think uh, er, uh, the world is going to end? I think it's going to be over by the time... You're even younger than me because I'm now quite old. Um, but I think the key to it will be having the ingenuity and creativity to develop the science and technology that allows us to develop sustainably. So I was just talking about Africa a moment ago. If the population doubles and the people all need to get the same things that we take for granted in the West. So they need electricity and transport and um, power generation and all the building. Uh, we've got to help them do that in a way that's clean and green. And you can only do that if you invent the science and technology to allow us to do so. But we're getting there. You know, we're doing a lot better than we did. In, you know, before you were born, um, when I was in the prime minister, solar power and wind power were considered pretty weird and not very viable things. And today they're a major part of our energy production. So no, I, I'm, I'm, I am optimistic about this, John. You will be younger than me by the time we're on top of this issue. Thank you. Well, Tony, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, that's been a fascinating discussion on a huge range of things. So um, on behalf of me, but also on behalf of Chatham House and all our audience today, a, a very big thank you for your time. Uh, to the audience, um, we will have future interviews uh, and we're hoping the next one will be with Dr. Henry Kissinger um, and uh, possibly the Canadian Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland. And we'll also have uh, former Foreign Secretaries William Hague and David Miliband in the chair. So we hope you'll join us for those. But in the meantime, uh, Tony, thank you for a fascinating discussion and some really interesting insights on the big challenges we face. So it's a really weird thing, but if we could just give a virtual clap to Tony um, and uh, I will say thank you to everyone. And this concludes the session. Thank you all.